Well, hello everyone. Welcome to Whitmix's webinar, Removable Technology for the Fixed Technician. My name is Bernie Jaroslow. I'm the marketing manager for Whitmix and I'll be facilitating the webinar this morning. So before we, we begin, I just want to go over a couple housekeeping items. Uh, first, you should see a questions box on your screen and you're uh, very welcome to to send in any questions you'd like to our speaker and I will verbally uh, share those questions with her at the end of the presentation and, uh, and she'll answer those one at a time. So uh, we're not gonna stop it in the middle, we'll do it at the very end. So please uh, write your questions down and I'll, I promise I'll get to them. Next, if you are a CDT or RG, the webinar is approved for one hour of CE credit and that, that will, within about, I'd say 24, hours or so you'll have uh, a notification thanking you for joining us and also how to get the CDT credit. Pretty easy. I will tell you it involves a very simple test and, and so, uh, so just pay attention. And then lastly, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, we also put that up on the Whitmix uh, website, uh, whitmix.com and in the webinar section and it will be there again within about a day. Uh, and it's also up on the Whitmix YouTube channel. So, uh, so that's that. Uh, that's that's the uh, housekeeping stuff. Now, I'd like to introduce uh, Allie Williamson. I have the pleasure of introducing her this morning. Uh, Allie is a CDT and a TE technical educator, and she's a graduate of Southern Illinois University at Carbondale with an associate's degree in dental tech, uh, lab technology and a bachelor's degree in advanced technical studies. Her subsequent lab experience strengthened her skills and opened opportunities to gain further knowledge. She eventually opened a full service lab with her soulmate, Mark Williamson, CDT DPG, a name I bet a lot of you are familiar with, uh, who is her husband and her career partner. Together they grew Essex Dental Lab into a successful full service boutique lab. And today Allie's the technical education specialist at the Ottawa Dental Laboratory in Ottawa, Illinois. Her webinar today identifies the parallels and differences of removable and fixed dental technology. It's dedicated to the fixed technician that wants to embrace their removable counterpart and vice versa. So learn what soft tissue landmarks are imperative for a removable product and in some cases, how it relates to occlusion and function with existing dentition. So Ali, if you're ready, I'm ready and I hope everyone else is ready. So let's talk about removable technology. Well, good morning and thank you, Bernie, for those kind words. And um, I wanna thank Wigmix for allowing me to do this presentation. And, um, and I wanna thank everybody who is attending this morning. Yeah, there's a lot of information here and this is one of the big questions I get as an educator uh, from fixed technicians. They want to learn about removable technology. Um, unfortunately, it's not the same fixed and removable. There are differences in occlusion and there are differences in boundaries and what it is we can do in fix that we can't necessarily do in removable and vice versa. So um, it's funny though that I feel like dentures is now getting a new um what's the word a new a new spotlight on it back in the early times of restorative dentistry in the 40s and 50s dentures was the thing everybody wanted to you know get a denture because you know they wanted to replace teeth but then they weren't very aesthetic and they were kind of cumbersome so we went to fix technology where obviously it's much more prettier and function, it functions just as well. But now with the new technology that's coming out with you know, digital technology and all on four conversions um, you know, and you know, demands from the patients, we're looking like fixed technicians need to understand more removable and removable need to understand more fixed so that we can all work together as one unit, as opposed to many labs always thought, well, the fixed department is on one side of the lab and the denture department's on the other side of the lab and they rarely had to communicate unless it was a combination case. So 
hopefully I'm going to shed some light today on, um, on removable technology for the fixed technician. So we'll go ahead and get started. So again, kind of talking about why the interest, you know, a lot of people are using surgical guides, um, as we talked about chair side conversions, diagnostic treatment. Um, the digital denture technology has boomed in the recent year or two, and it leads us to complex dentistry and patient demand. So this is going to be something that is going to be a, a new to a lot of the fixed technicians, perhaps. But at the end of the day, we're all trying to do the same thing, fixed and removable. We're trying to restore missing dentition and, um, and missing tissue as well. We want the patient to function correctly and comfortably. We want to make sure that we have the aesthetics that the patient's gonna be satisfied with and overall patient satisfaction. You know, are they gonna you know, recommend us to you know, the, our, our customers, the dentists, to their you know, friends and family? Are we able to deliver what we say we're gonna deliver? And of course we want to, when we start, we want to start with making sure that we're able to predict the outcome of this actual um, prosthesis. So let's talk about fixed restorations in general, real basic. So when we have to do like some type of major restoration, we'll probably start with a pre-op model and a diagnostic wax up, which you know I think everybody can agree to that. Once we realize that, you know what, we can get this to work, we have it go through the functions on the articulator, then we'll make, you know, the temporary um, restoration. You know, let's make sure that this patient's gonna be able to function with it. Um, once we know that they're successful with those temporaries, we'll make some type of tools and um, landmarks that will help us make the final restoration like with an incisal edge matrix, we register the overjet and overbite of the restorations, especially in the anterior, we mark the midline, um, the level of the occlusal table, we do all that. At the, you know, at, at the part where we start making the actual restorations, we'll also you know, make an incisal guide table so that the articulator is functioning the way it would in the patient's mouth we line up the wear facets, and of course we want anterior guidance so that it protects the posterior teeth and um, it makes the patient comfortable and functioning the way they should for um, forever, hopefully, you know, if everything is done correctly. Our goals in fixed restoration is that we want anterior guidance, you know, canine rise and posterior disclusion we want to relate the design of, you know, say we're making a full arch and, uh, such as these examples, we want to make sure it's going to relate to the opposing arch. Now both arches could be working models or you could have existing technicians, I mean dentitians, and we want our restoration to function with the existing dentition. That's fine. And of course, you know, we have um, the opposing teeth to dictate how we're going to build that particular restoration. At the end, we want to achieve, you know, even occlusion. occlusion. We want to make sure that we're not violating any um, boundaries in, in the occlusion theories that we know. Uh, we need to make sure that there's enough support to, for the bite. And we want to make sure that the crowns look individualized and that the tissue stays healthy and, um, and, and is able to look more natural around our restoration. So I think we can all agree that, you know, this is, these are some of the goals that we try to achieve when we're making a fixed restoration. Now, in dentures, it's quite different because you, you may not have any existing dentition to help you uh, figure out where the teeth are supposed to go. You may not have um, wear facets to tell you how the movements are supposed to be. Is this going to function correctly? So 
there's so many different techniques out there on how to um, do dentures. You know, I know PTC has a great system, um, which I personally use to train our students here at the Ottawa Dental Lab. Um, a lot of people that go to school, to accredited schools, learn through the Air Force Manual. Um, that's how I learned when I went to school. Learned everything through that. Um, Jack Turbyfill has the branching technique. And that, of course, was um, derived by Earl Pound's technique. And very, very um, educated and, um, and skilled mentor of mine, um, Dr. Turbyfill. And then, you know, there are things that dentists have learned in the, you know, from school. They'll use the Fox plane, they might use face bows, um, they might, you know, just do the best they can to achieve um, the, the restoration they want. A lot of times they end up just calling the lab and say, okay, what do you need? You know, what do you need from me so that I can make a successful and predictable denture? So really it comes down to keeping it simple. So we all know the KISS technique. And um, as long as we understand the difference between fixed occlusion and denture occlusion, I think we'll be safe. But a lot of times we try to apply fixed occlusion to the denture case. And it's not necessarily that simple to the point where um, we think we know what we have to do. So in removable denture technology, we need to make sure we have minimal overjet and overbite regardless of what the patient may have had back in the day. Um, you know, when they had their natural dentition, they might have been a severe class two with a very deep overbite. Well, that's something that we can't necessarily do in dentures and we'll explain why in a minute. As far as the teeth are concerned, where we're setting the posterior teeth especially, we wanna set over the crest of the alveolar ridge. Now, some of you may think that, um, that well, you know, we wanna make sure it looks, it looks aesthetic and we have to go off the ridge. We want to make sure we fill in those buccal corridors so we don't have this big black void going down when they smile. Well, something you may not know is when an edentulous patient is healing and then eventually the bone starts receding, on the upper arch, the bone will always recede lingually. So it's going to be narrower. On the lower arch, when the patient recedes for an extended period of time, they're going to recede buccally. So if a patient has been missing teeth for a long time, they're going to be in crossbite. The ridges are going to relate in crossbite. That is very, very common. And that's one thing that we need to be aware of when we're setting denture teeth. So we also want to be aware of when we set um, the incisal edges and the cusp tips. When we determine our plane of occlusion, we need to make sure that our incisal edges and cusp tips are placed strategically on that plane. So that way we have stability in the dentures and we have aesthetics obviously and that it's going to function the way it's meant to be fu to, to function. We don't want it to be tipping, we don't want it to be dislodging, and we don't want it to be pinching on the patient. So that leads us into working and balancing occlusion. That is a fancy denture term for group function. I think it's funny that in fixed terminology, we call it groom function, and in denture terminology, we call it working and balancing. It's the same thing. We just want to make sure that all the teeth are functioning together simultaneously to avoid any type of mishap for the patient. Now, in dentures, we also need to consider the tissue, which isn't something we typically do with, um, with fixed restorations. You know, sometimes we might see that the tissue is receded excessively and we do need to adapt some pink porcelain um, around the necks of teeth to give them a little bit of uh, lip support or some aesthetics. 
But with dentures, you have to consider all of the tissue because if the, if the bone has receded excessively, well, the tissue is going to recede with it. So we need to fill out that patient's face again, um, buccally and labially. Um, we have to make sure that the patient feels comfortable, that they don't feel like you know they have a big truck in their mouth, but that they're able to look aesthetic and younger and it could take years off of you know, their, their image. So um, the occlusion fundamental differences. In fixed, we typically want to have anterior guidance. We want that canine to, um, to dictate where our occlusion function is going to be and our posterior teeth are, are not touching at all. With dentures, we want to make sure we have that group function. So I don't know if you could see my mouse, but if you could see right here in the posterior, right here in the middle and in the anterior, there's always contact. Whereas in a fixed restoration, there's only anterior guidance. So this is something that we need to be careful with in dentures that we always maintain. If a patient existing dentition was a deep class two and it came all the way down in the incisal, well, we're not gonna be able to do that again. Um, we could place the incisal edge on that and in the same position, but then the lower anterior teeth are gonna to have to come way down and that occlusal table is gonna be adjusted accordingly so that they can still maintain group function. So to achieve that, what we do is we need to make sure we maintain an ideal curve of Spee, an ideal curve of Wilson. So you all may know that as the sphere of Monson. So in order to maintain that, we have to set the teeth and group function over the ridge. Now we know that the sphere of Monson is also in correlation with the condyle. So this is going to dictate pretty much how the dentures are going to function. Um, obviously, it, dit it, dit ugh, it dictates the natural dentition as well, but with the prostheses, it's going to have to function according to the joint movement. So in fixed restorations, what we'll typically do is we'll prep the tooth and really the prep design that the doctor gives us will determine the stability of that crown. If we have a prep that is um, very compromised in its height or if in its shape, um, you know, the margins might be spot on, but it, the, the actual prep itself has to be rounded that's going to affect the stability of our restoration. So we know that that margin has to be designed also to be able to tolerate that prep design or support that prep design. So if we have to build up our understructure, say for example, for a PFM, and it's gonna be kind of tall because there's excessive clearance between the opposing teeth and the actual prep, well then we need to make sure that, that prep, the margin design is going to be able to support that prep design, or I'm sorry, that um, coping design. So once it's designed and we know that it's going to support everything, um, accurately and it's going to support the porcelain as well because you can't have you know unsupported porcelain once the doctor cements it that's going to hold it all together and we're hoping for an intimate cement um bond between the restoration and the prep tooth well with removable you don't have that um you don't have anything to help support it in height and in width. You don't have opposing teeth to, well, in this case, if we're working on full over full dentures, 
We don't have opposing teeth to guide the restorations into occlusion um, and help them function correctly. We're at the mercy of the soft tissue. And the certain landmarks that are, there are certain landmarks to soft tissue that are imperative to the success and predictability of a denture. So we need to make sure we have these landmarks um, identified on our working casts. And if we don't, really we're, we're setting ourselves up for failure. This is when I think it's important that we reach out to our customer and let them know, I see that I am short on some of the impression here. I need this landmark to be more detailed. Will it be possible? And if they say no, go with it. Okay, well then now we need to make sure that the responsibility of the success of that denture is gonna be in the doctor's hands and not necessarily ours because we only have the master cast to work with. So some of the landmarks that are important for us to make sure we have when we're working on dentures is on the upper, on the maxilla, you have to make sure that you're able to identify the incisive papilla and the midline, which would be the median suture line. Um, you need to be able to read the alveolar ridge without blurbs um, and without pulls or discrepancies. The hamular notches, which are down here, this is the muscle attachment that attaches the upper, the maxilla, to the back of the throat. So we need to make sure that we're able to see a distinct transition from the maxilla to the rest of the soft tissue, which would be the back of the throat, and it would be the hamular notch, this, this muscle attachment here. The fovea palatina. These are two little glands, and what they do is they allow us to know where the ending point of the hard palate and the soft palate are. So in between the fovea palatina is still a hard bony structure, which is where the hard palate now is going to meet the soft palate. So this being the soft palate, I mean the hard palate, and this loop here or this roller coaster thing here is going to be the soft palate. And on a model, you have to identify it to be able to have suction, whoops, sorry, suction with the denture and typically we would make a butterfly post dam and we'll talk about that a little bit more later when we finalize our denture so we're able to have a seal with the upper denture to the mouth so it stays in place and it doesn't fall out um, also we're gonna what we would need to to complete a successful upper denture is the buccal and, um, and labial frenae. We need to identify that. These are the muscle attachments over here that connect the cheeks to the side, um, of the, I'm sorry, this, the cheeks to the alveolar process, which is the bone. Um, these frenae, they tend to stretch and pull and um, can move around and we need to make sure that we leave room on the denture base for these frenae and we can't pinch them because once they start functioning and pulling and moving, they may dislodge a denture. Also, we need to make sure we know how far to extend a denture. So we need to know where the labial and buccal vestibule are or some people might call that the um, I forget what they call it now. Uh, Air Force Manual calls it uh, the corridor or something like that. And um, we need to know how far to extend this denture so that way it's stable also. Kind of thinking about when we talked about the prep of, the, of a crown, of a PFM crown, if the crown is really short, you need to have margins to be able to support the or the shoulders to be able to support um, the the actual restoration. Well, the same thing goes for a denture. 
if you don't have the vestibule, how are we gonna be able to support that denture? Um, it'll just be laying on top of the alveolar process. So that's why it's important to identify the actual vestibular role. Now, one thing that a lot of people don't know about are the buccal pouches. And what the buccal pouches are, are an indentation right here on the sides of the maxillary. And it's right anterior to the tuberosity. This is important to identify because when we have an upper denture, we will want to extend our denture all the way into the vestibule, into the buccal vestibule. The thing is that the lower mandible, obviously that's redundant, the mandible has this eminence that's called the coronoid process. And the coronoid process, when the, when the mandible functions, will fall right against the upper, um, the maxilla, and it'll, it will fit right into this buccal pouch. Now, if we cover the buccal pouch with a flange to the denture, it's going to dislodge it or it's going to hurt the patient. So when we finish our denture, we need to make sure that we relieve for this buccal pouch. And this is something that I see a lot of technicians um, fail to do. And then the patient feels pain, goes to the dentist, and then the dentist chair side starts reaming out the denture, not exactly knowing why they're in so much pain back there. And typically it's the buccal pouch. For the mandible, the landmarks that are important for a mandible are also the alveolar ridge, the bone, um, the retromolar pads and the papillae. Now that's that pear shaped um, bony structure that's right here. Now the retromolar pad is very, is, is bony, it's hard. It's like the foundation of the posterior part of a denture. That is going to keep the denture from sinking in to the soft tissue, which this eventually can either become spongy, can become soft, can become thin. Um, we need that brick back here, which is the retromolar pad, to hold it in place. We also need to make sure we have the buccal shelf. This area is a bony area as well that allows our denture to seat on it, but it won't allow it to fall into the buccal vestibule. So our denture really finishes right here and should not finish beyond that because now it's going to rub against this buccal shelf and it's going to hurt the patient. So we need to make sure that we only extend our denture to the buccal shelf. The buccal, labial, and lingual frene are the muscle attachments, as you know. And as we discussed with the maxilla, we need to make sure we leave room for those so that they can stretch and move and um, function the way they normally would um, if there was not a denture in place. Now the mentalis muscle, is a muscle that's on the anterior sides of the midline. And what that muscle does, it allows you to pull your lip up and, and pout, basically. If you ever wanna roll your lip out, your lower lip out, that's the mentalis muscle functioning. If we were to cover the mentalis muscle with acrylic, it's gonna dislodge the denture and it's not gonna stay stable. So we need to make sure that we keep room for that as well. The mylohyoid ridge is this area right here. If you notice, there is some lattice marked on the cast distal to that ridge that's right there. That lattice area is called the retromylohyoid space. It's soft tissue and it, it, it has no support from a bone at all. The mylohyoid ridge is a bony structure, very hard. It'll come 
from the retromolar pad down to the floor of the mouth and down under the tongue and it will eventually attach to the hyoid bone um, with muscle attachments. But this space here cannot be covered in acrylic base either because it's going to engage an undercut and that patient's gonna have a heck of a time trying to get that denture on and off. So it's gonna rub against them, they're gonna feel uncomfortable and the doctor chair side will probably end up eliminating that flange as well. So we wanna make sure we're gonna make the job easier for the dentist. So they seat it, it's gonna be stable and we're not going to overextend it and make more room, more work for him chair side. So a lot of times dentists will call the laboratory and asks, how do I know, you know, how to, um, so a lot of de dentists don't like making dentures and they'll, they may even refer them out to a different dentist. Um, how do I know where to place the teeth? How do I know what the um, occlusion is gonna be? How do I know how the jaws are gonna relate? Well, there are some tools that are used out there and we as technicians are at the mercy of the information the dentist gives us to successfully make these dentures. So going back real old school, these tools have been around for decades. And I find it um, peculiar that a lot of dentists don't use them. And in fact, a lot of times as denture technicians, um, they don't typically get a lot of information from the dentist when they have to make the denture. But in a perfect world, a dentist would give us an allometer reading. And what that does, it's a, an instrument here that will measure from one side of the ala of the nose to the other side. And this will give us the canine positions. This will tell us the long axis of the canine, where it needs to be wow. um, in, in, um, in relation to the upper arch and the lower arch. Now, when we do the papillometer, the papillometer is going to tell us how far down the lip is hanging from the um, labial um, frena, frena. So right here is a papillometer reading and right here would be the allometer reading. And of course the doctor then would indicate the midline by looking at the patient's face, um, going to, to the, the center of the, of the pupils and perhaps looking at um, the nose, if they have a straight nose, or the frene, um, or the frenum actually, or the frene of the upper and the lower, and they'll determine the middle of the mouth. Now, as technicians, we need to look at the soft, I mean, the soft tissue landmarks that the doctor will provide for us on the cast and make sure that the markings that he's giving us on the bite rim are pretty much in alignment with the actual landmarks themselves. But it also helps when the doctor sends us headshots. Um, in, in, our, in, in fixed, we like getting a real tight shot of a, of a tooth so that we can see all the characteristics to an individual tooth. We might look for craze lines, check lines. We might look for excessive wear, calcifications, um, maybe even some deformities in a, in a tooth. But in a removable point of view, a real tight shot like that doesn't do the technician any good. They need to see the full face. They need to see how the smile is gonna to relate to the entire image and not just focus on an individual restoration. They need to focus on the entire tissue, on the aesthetics of the relation of one tooth to another. So as long as we have these resources that the dentist is providing for us, um, using instruments and, um, and tools, um, here is a fox plane. So a lot of doctors, um, it, 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 I mean, 
they can use the FACEBO transfer jig and they'll put a fox plane there which will tell us what the level of the occlusal table should be. They'll place it in the ears, bring it down, and they will see according to um, the patient's face where the level should be. But a lot of times we don't get these tools. So what happens? Um, many times, and a lot of denture technicians, if you're out there, you, you could probably relate to this, you know that the doctor may not even modify the bite rim that you sent them. Um, you send them a bite rim following the measurements that you know uh, we, we learned how to do. And next thing you know, <laughs> the doctor just took a blue moose bite impression or bite registration with the two bite rims in place and nothing was modified on the bite rims. So if we make bite rims and the doctor doesn't modify them in any way, then we are awesome technicians because we knew exactly what the, the plane of occlusion was. We knew exactly what the contour of the patient's mouth was without having to even see the patient. Well, I find that hard to believe. So doctors typically would need to modify and tell us where these landmarks are. And when they don't, the technician needs to read the landmarks, the soft tissue landmarks. So what we do is we will take the, the maxilla and we know the bite, the doctor has sent us the bite registrations. He sent us an upper and lower bites and bite rims. We articulated it. So now we have to believe that that vertical dimension is correct and that the lateral um, position of the mandible is correct. That's the only thing that we cannot decipher without the doctor. We have to have that clinically from the dentist. But if we see that they took the bite registration, we mounted the cast, but everything else doesn't seem to be lining up with what we know about the landmarks, then this is what we'll do. And this is how we verify. From the vestibule, the anterior vestibule of the maxilla down, we want to make sure that we average 22 millimeters. So that is the average measurement of the incisal edge from the anterior vestibule to the occlusal plane. Then from this landmark, we're going to look at the lower and we're going to identify the retromolar pads. Now, the retromolar pads, you want to divide it into three sections. One, two, and then the top of that is three. The occlusal plane will fall on the middle third of the retromolar pad. So the retromolar pad has a small little uh, papilla here where all the nerves meet. And at the top of this papilla is the beginning of the middle third of the retromolar pad. So if you can identify the papilla and you can identify the retromolar pad, you will be able to identify the height of the occlusal plane towards the posterior. And towards the anterior, it's gonna be 12, I'm sorry, 22 millimeters from the vestibule of the upper anterior um, distance here. So upper anterior vestibule is 22, that's your front occlusal plane. And then in the posterior, your retromolar pad is divided into three, that's your posterior occlusal plane. So here we have the retromolar pads identified and we identified where the incise, the retromolar papilla is and we go above it and that's where the a posterior occlusal plane is, we connect the two. And then from 22 millimeters, we come down and that would be the anterior. So that's setting up our occlusal plane. So when we start setting teeth, we want to make sure that we know the overjet of those anterior teeth. So typically on a male, the overjet will be five millimeters. And on a female, the overjet is seven millimeters. 
nowadays with HIPAA and all that, you really don't know if it's a female or a male when you're making a denture. So go in between, go to six. So um, there's a way to figure out how to measure that over jet. To do that, Many of you may be familiar with an ALMA gauge. A lot of removable technicians will use this. And what this does, it allows us to measure from the intaglio of a denture, positioning it at the incisive papilla. You can see here that this pin, there's a pin here and this lever goes up and down. This pin will engage to the incisive papilla depression and in the intaglio of a denture and it will tell us how far facially we are setting that incisal edge so it'll give us a distance of either 5 10 now in this particular example the doctor told us i need a vertical height of 10 millimeters so there's a distance right here measurement right here that tells us the incisal edge to the, to the um, incisal papilla is 10 millimeters. So we measure that. And then he's telling us, oh, I'm sorry, I just said that backwards. The height is five millimeters. It's going in here, so five. And no, I was right. This is going to be the horizontal. This is gonna be the vertical. Vertical is 10, horizontal, five. So, sorry, I got a little screwed up. I had a little bit of a brain aneurysm there, but I'm all better now. So we're able to measure the vertical and the height of the actual um, anterior plane. Now, when we're making digital dentures, when we're designing them, um, I'll be honest, I, I kind of had a hard time um, embracing this whole technology because I was an analog denture technician for many years. And then when digital came along, I, I was asking questions that I don't know if I had the answer to. And one of my questions was, well, how do you know where to place the, the occlusal plane on, um, on a digital model and digital denture if you don't have the landmarks. So clearly you could see here that this to me looks like a retromolar pad, but I can't tell for sure. And the plane obviously is way above the retromolar pad. So what we do is we use the patient's existing dentures and that will determine the occlusal plane. So what we did is with the bite registration taken with the existing dentures, we used that as our occlusal plane. And then we made an incisal edge matrix of these or a, a measurement of the incisal edge for the overjet to place our anterior teeth. Now, um, if it was a fully edentulous patient and you did not have the existing dentures, um, I would say we would probably have to go back to good old reliable measurements of what we did before with identifying the retromolar pads and um, taking our measurement from the vestibule. But if we don't have that, uh, we're gonna have to either ask the doctor for a more accurate scan, or we're just going to have to trust that we make an intelligent um, position of calculating where that table should be. So say he does send us a bite rim. And luckily enough, we have an existing lower dentition. Well, then we're gonna follow that to tell us where that occlusal plane needs to be. Of course, the lower anterior teeth are going to dictate where that incisal edge position is gonna be in relation to the ridge. Now, remember, we said that all denture teeth have to be set over the alveolar ridge, over the crest of the ridge. Now, if you have a ridge that is an excessive class three, 
and you can bring your overjet out, but you want to make the patient a class one and the ridge stops, the crest of the ridge is somewhere back here. Well, we're gonna run into an issue and we need to ask the doctor, is this where you want? Because if that's the case, I'm gonna have to bring everything out forward, but now we're gonna risk the um, denture tipping and dislodging when they go to function. So again, we need to maintain minimal overjet and overbite and keep the group function even with natural teeth. But if the doctor is asking us to violate these rules, then we need to make sure that um, the, dentures, the dentist is made aware of that and that you know, we're not doing anything that the doctor is not expecting. So when we set the plane, we've used our anatomical landmarks and we now are going to um, set the plane of occlusion according to that 22 and across the retromolar pads. And then we start setting our teeth. To maintain group function, it is best to um, follow a formula of setting teeth. You want the centrals to touch the plane. You want the laterals and canines to be off of the plane one millimeter. The first bicuspids are going to touch on the buccal cusp only. Second bicuspids touch on the buccal and lingual cusp equally. On the first molar, the mesial lingual cusp touches only. And the second molar, nothing touches. So by doing that, we are achieving a curve of speed and a curve of Wilson. So now everything is exactly where we need it to be. So when we set the lower teeth, they're gonna fit right into place and it will be in harmony with the soft tissue landmarks and with the denture teeth set to an ideal plane of occlusion. So when we set the lower teeth, we want to set them with minimal overjet and overbite, group function on both sides and in protrusive. So when we go into protrusive, we would also have contact in the anterior and the posterior holding that denture stable and we would have even centric contact. Now, again, we want to make sure we don't have any interferences when we go into group function because that will dislodge the denture. So in a nutshell, um, we have already done our setups and we're ready to process. Processing, there's different procedures for that. And I didn't want to get that a whole different type of um, webinar that we could do, but today for lack of time, we're just gonna go ahead and talk about the extensions of a final oops, of a final denture. And what you wanna do is you wanna make sure on the maxillary, you create the post palatal seal on the soft, dividing the soft tissue and the hard tissue. It's hard to see on this one, but um, there's a post palatal seal. This is typically for analog dentures. On a digital dentures, because it's so precise, the actual um, technology, it, it, in theory, you really don't need a post dam. A post dam was created for compensation of the shrinkage of the acrylic when it was done the analog way. But we, since we're not making a denture analog way when in, in digital dentures, we don't necessarily have to put in a post dam. You wanna relieve for the frenum on the buckle, on the labial and the other side. So the frene are relieved. And then we're also relieving for the buckle pouch. Remember we talked about that, that we don't want the coronoid process to dislodge the denture. On the mandible, we wanna make sure we cover the retromolar pad lower third, which is the, the retromolar papilla, because that is gonna act as our brick, our foundation to keep the denture stable. We wanna extend the border to the crest of the, the buckle shelf. So we don't want it to go past that into the vestibule because then that will dislodge the denture as well. We want to um, extend the lingual flange on the mylohyoid area 
to the crest of the retro of uh, the mylohyoid ridge we don't want to go into the mylo retro mylohyoid space because that's an undercut that is going to probably get cut off at chair side when the patient can't tolerate it and then we want to relieve for the mentalis muscles right here it's a very subtle relief and you just want to make sure that it's not going to dislodge your denture you're going to give that muscle room to uh, move. So in conclusion, it's just about teamwork. Um, I hope I shed some light on the occlusion for removable versus the occlusion that we would practice for fixed. You know, there are some similarities. We want to help this patient out, but you know, we are, there are certain rules that we can't violate when we're doing removable. And there are certain um, rules that we need to honor when we're doing fix. So um, I hope this helped you and gave you some um, information. And there's a lot more to be discussed about dentures and how it correlates to fixed, but we're limited for time. So, you know, um, this was all kind of wrapped up into a neat nutshell. And if you have any questions, just feel free to call me or email me and I can be found at the Ottawa Dental Laboratory. Um, we're a, a pretty large lab here in the Midwest and we're very proud of our education department and we do a lot to help not only technicians but the whole profession in a whole, as a whole to advance knowledge and um, get everybody on the same page. Thank you, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ali. Great job. Really appreciated it. Learned a lot. Reminded me a lot of what I had already learned and long since forgot. So thank you for that. Uh, just want to remind everyone, uh, there's the question box. Uh, there are no questions listed here as of this moment, but you're welcome to put them in within the next moment or two as I review some of the things I said at the beginning. So go right ahead. You're, we're happy to uh, entertain those questions. Uh, just a, as a reminder, if you are a CDT or RG, you're going to be able to, to have uh, credit, one hour credit uh, for recertification. It will take about a day or so, and then you'll receive the information on how that's accomplished. And the second thing is, uh, this has been recorded. It will be up on the WIPMIX website in the webinar section. Uh, and for further uh you know, list, watching or listening. And if you have people in the lab or friends that have not uh, seen this, they're welcome to uh, view it online or even in our YouTube channel. Uh, but the great, the great thing is uh, the test is also with it. So you'll be able to get credit, whether it's you're listening to it now or, or uh, watching the video in the future. So anyway, we want to thank you for joining us. Nobody has typed any questions in, so I think we'll end the webinar. Thank you for your time. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at another WITMIX webinar in the near future. Thanks, and thanks again, Allie. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Bye.